Rose is, uh, she's from Maine. She's a business called Overland Honey of Maine. She's a, 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 a the what? Yeah, director, chairman of the East Neighbor Culture Society board. Uh, and I'm going to let her tell you have the rest about yourself from there. Um, so here's Aaron Phillips. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Queen Ring. This is a presentation that I gave in Virginia, and so it's got a little bit of introduction stuff, but some of it is also still fun. Um, so I did just want to mention, I, I said earlier that I have nine colonies of the Botanic Gardens. If you guys want to come visit, then please do. Um, we are actually in the middle of a giant, um, executing a big master plan. We just built, or we're building, I think we're going to get our CFO next month, um, a great, big, huge new visitor center. And then we're going to build a new um, horticultural research part and a little bit of working farm. And part of that is going to be to expand our apiary from what is currently nine hives to probably around 40. And one of my goals as the CFO, COO of the organization is to create a beekeeping internship, which is basically, I think, going to be the coolest internship in the country um, to come and run the hives at the Botanic Gardens. One of the things that's really interesting to me um, personally, and I don't have any research background in this, but um, you know, I've of course been planting for bees in my yard ever since we got bees, and you know, I have a number of different things that I use and different stuff, and that's all cool. But at the Botanic Garden, you know, we have this vast ornamental garden that everything is actually planted right, irrigated right, in the right soil. And I have nine colonies there, and so I often in the daytime will just go out walking around, and I am shocked at what the bees are on and what they are rejecting in the face of having these other things. Like you go by and there's this beautiful, you know, big, fluffy, gorgeous, like, like dripping <coughs> with sugar lavender plant and the bees are like hitting this astilbe like crazy. And I'm like, a astilbe? Are you kidding me? A shade loving plant that they're preferring? Given that they're both are blooming. So it's just really interesting. So that's part of my, um, my dream at the Botanic Garden is that my intern, who will be running the 40 colonies, will also spend a certain number of hours every day cataloging what the bees are hitting and, more importantly, what they're not hitting at the time that they are hitting different things. So that'll be fun. But it's super cool to be the accountant at a place where they actually, you know, where my core values and their core values are the same. Um, and so that's super fun. Um, this year we're doing a whole butterfly thing, which is fun, um, and obviously everything that they like, we like, so that's all good. I wanted to just make a quick plug for EAS, which is in Hampton, Virginia. Um, I was gonna say, oh, I think that right now, right there somewhere is a click here for, for hotel registration now. But so um, EAS is the largest non-commercial beekeeping organization in the country and we hold a conference every year. It's really um, a huge educational opportunity and uh, you can meet and hang out with all kinds of very interesting beekeepers. It's a big jump start. It's kind of like, there are, there are speakers at EAS who make me look tired and unenthusiastic, <laughs> um, if you can believe that. Um, and so this year EAS is in Hampton, Virginia. Next year is going to be in Greensboro, South Carolina. The following year it's going to probably be in Orono, Maine. And then after that we're most likely going to be down at the New Bee Lab in Florida and then hoping to come back to the fine state of Massachusetts, maybe. So that's kind of the schedule. Um, but Hampton, Virginia is going to be really great. The Virginia beekeepers are super active, and the organizing club is really um, into uh, kind of some deeper dives into non-traditional stuff. So there's a whole track on the Russian Bee Breeder Program. They are holding, the Russian bee breeders are holding their annual conference at EAS, so they're all going to be there and doing lots of talking about that. They've got a real, their, their whole, the Virginia, for some reason people in Virginia seem to think that the whole United States started there. I'm not really sure what the deal is with that Jamestown, whatever, but they are convinced that the first bees brought to the United States. The first U European honeybees came in through Jamestown, which I don't think is actually true. I think Spanish people brought bees to Florida before that. But anyway, <laughs> that's what they think. 
And so they're bringing all kinds of international speakers in as well, which is um, mostly from England. So there's a lot of, there will be a lot of interesting people who aren't necessarily, that we don't get a lot of exposure here. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Um, EAS, yeah, you should come. These are some of the speakers. Celia Davis is from, the, from, um, from England. Uh, Randy Oliver, you guys all know him. Mike Palmer. Sammy Ramsey, does everybody here know Sammy Ramsey? Oh, he's so good. He's so cute. I was he and I were he and I were giving a talk together in Virginia. Th th this talk, he was there, and um, he's just so fun to hang out with. He's like 25 year old PhD student who's like rocking the universe right now. Um, anyway, here I am talking to beekeepers in Missouri. I don't know why I put that slide there. Oh, oh, this was actually so. Sometimes I steal other people's slides. Um, this was, uh, this was a slide that, Tam, that Sammy had on his thing where he was talking about colony losses and the uh, report of reasons of why beekeepers are um, explaining why their losses are over wintering. And so starvation is number one reason that backyard beekeepers were claiming. Number two was weak in the fall. And number three was poor wintering conditions. And then when you look at the sideliners and commercial beekeepers, they're talking about varroa mites and small hive beetles and varroa mites and queen failure. And I don't mean to sound like a jerk, but none of these things are actually reasons. Number one, number two, and number three. Like, these are management problems. These aren't, re you know, this is like poor beekeeping, poor beekeeping, and poor beekeeping. And so it's just really important that, I'm glad that you guys are all here learning and are doing this, and it's important that you encourage the beekeepers around you who don't learn stuff and who do say things like, my bees died because they starved. Like, that's, that's, that's not my bees died because they starved. It's like, I killed them by starving them. Anyway, it's just important. Um, I'm gonna just jump through this um, because... I don't because my, my karma is all around the bees, but I can. I can do it. Um, oh, Debbie Delaney, super adorable, also involved with the um, Appalachian Bee Collective, um, which I wanted to throw a quick slide. And again, like I said, this is where Cindy is working now. Uh, and what they're doing is it's a basically a um, combination of teaching beekeeping and mountaintop reforestation. So essentially when they blow the tops off of these mountains, it doesn't matter how much trying to plant soil and new plants they have, but they've also killed the native pollinators. So the typical way of um, doing the reforestation projects is to hire in commercial beekeepers to bring bees so that the plants can do their reproductive acts too. But what this collective is trying to do is actually train beekeepers there in West Virginia and create jobs, which not to sound like a me first northerner, but there are systemic reasons why West Virginia is West Virginia and they are also having to battle all of those systemic reasons, like, um, you know, the opioid crisis and all that crap. So it's, there's a lot more to it than just beekeeping, which is also really interesting, is to try to um, kind of battle some of those things. And so it's cool that there are people doing this stuff um, and the fact that Cindy and Debbie are both involved um, makes me hope that they will actually work out. So let's talk about, oh, okay, so I'm gonna slide past the, this is the Sarah project. Oh, actually, that's why I put this here. So we went back, I was saying here, are my alive colonies, 40%, 45% of the packages colonies were alive, 75% of the northern ones were alive, but ready for spring, we had 24% of the packages were ready for spring, and 64% of the northern combined colonies were ready for spring. <coughs> and like I said, the be informed partnership, we were sliding in in that scale. And this, the reason that I'm keeping putting this in here is these people are doing really interesting work and it is this work that we use when we write a grant application to do something. Like we can say beekeepers across the United States are experiencing this kind of thing and I think you know my management technique is gonna do this thing and then I'm showing this. And so that's kind of a fundamental for um, making decisions and also for you know making grant proposals and stuff. And so it's important that they get more and more data. Also, so please do participate this. It comes out in April. So beinformed.org, I'm sure your state association sends everybody the email saying it because everybody forwards it. So it really is important to have data. But one of the other interesting things they're doing now is these sentinel apiaries and monitoring programs. And so I actually participated in this a couple of years ago when they were calling it the tier four monitoring program. And 
this is a really interesting thing. So what you do is you pay, I think the current price is about $500 a year, and they send you a kit to have four hives monitored, and every month you just go into your hive and you take a little sample of bees and alcohol and you mail them off to BIP. And BIP tests your bees for Varroa and for Nosema, and then they send you your results and also compare your results to everybody else who's sending results this month, and also compare your results to the historical results. And so, and the reason that I'm talking about this is, is so this is me talking to you right now very quickly about my Varroa mite management plan, which is what I was saying earlier is that I use IPM strategies in Varroa, and so I have the early break in the brood cycle, I monitor through the summer, and then I treat once in the fall. And that is like, that is my strategy, and that's what I'm sticking to until something else makes me change. But you can see, so I sent in um, no samples in April, because it's too early to be collecting bee samples in April. They wanted them basically on the 15th of every month. So I didn't collect in April, but the average tier four this year was uh, four to uh, one and a half, Bees, four to one and a half, right? From the high to the low of Varroa per hundred bees, right? Varroa mites per hundred bees. So I sent in a sample in May, and I had no Varroa in any of my four samples. These are my four colonies. I sent in samples in June, and I had 0.4 per 100 bees in two colonies, and two colonies had zero Varroa mites. Now, May is when I would have, that is my breaking the brood cycle time, right in there somewhere between these two. July, I still have zero in two colonies. I have 1.2 varroa per 100 bees in one colony, and 5.4, which they sent to me as a red flag. Like, watch out, you got a high load here. And I looked at this and I said, that's gotta be an anomaly. Like, I didn't treat. I'm like, okay, I'm cool, but I know it. I actually have the data. And then August comes around, I still haven't treated, and we're back, we're still way under the treatment threshold, because the treatment threshold is three per, per 100 bees. And then I sent in my samples in September, which is when I normally treat, and treat. And that, so this is, this is the results of what my actual management strategy is, my IPM strategy, is that I basically never get above the threshold, and then I treat with April FR, which is, again, the organic mite treatment um, that is made up of um, thymol, eucalyptus, and menthol. Now, so, oops. So here are my Nosema spores. I don't know if everybody tells you down here that everybody should be treating every colony with fumagillin every year. That's kind of the recommendation in Maine, at least, um, and has been for many years. And I do own a bottle of fumagillin, which I keep in my freezer, but I've never used it, and I have never needed to. So here's me comparing my Nosema spores to, so my monthly average compared to the average monthly for this year. Um, and again, my, my levels are, have always been so low that I haven't needed to treat. And so not only can I stand up here and tell you that I, you know, have great management and I can show you pictures of my beehives and I can say that this is what I do and I don't need to worry about other things, but now I actually have the empirical data that I can show you over an entire season. This is my sampling. And you too can get this for a mere $500 sent to the um, BIP. And actually now, if you, so here's my, this is my little, oops, I send you little graphs. I can be so proud of myself because I'm the light blue people. That made me feel good. Like that's, this is what they're saying in their Varroa crashes and I'm like chunking right along down here with that weird little anomaly which still didn't even become a crisis. So it's nice to have your actual own real data. And so for 500 bucks, that's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of beekeeping to actually know what is happening and you can you know, adjust your, your management strategies accordingly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to this. Uh, I guess it doesn't say it. There's another thing, you can spend another something kind of ridiculous, like maybe another $600, but they will also do pesticide surveys of your, of your bees. And so you can get a lot of information through Bee Inform, and so it's beeinform.org. Um, I think Sentinel Apiaries and Programs are the two places. Um, so it's very worthwhile to actually learn what is going on in your own yard. And so I highly recommend considering doing that. But so now let's talk about queen rearing. Okay. So I've just kind of given you the long spiel on the fact that Northern, I believe that Northern and or boutique race, both of which you guys would qualify for, queens do better 
heading colonies up here than do commercial packages queens, the ones that come with whatever it is that you bought that came with your bees. And so I want to enable you to do your own queenery. And I know that I say that everything is the funnest thing to talk about in the whole world and everything is so cool and you know, catching swarms is the funnest thing in the world. But catching queens, like finding your own mated versions in your own mating nucleus colonies is even more fun than swarming. Or better yet, you come home from catching a swarm and then you go out to your mating new colonies and you, you know, mark your queens too. And then you have both. Um, I also increase control over your apiary. You know, I'm, you know, I'm an accountant, but really I'm a controller. I'm a Virgo. I like having everything be the way I want. Like I want my bees to be the biggest, strongest, best colonies, and I want to participate in that. And queen rearing is a piece of that. Um, it also, oops, does make you incredibly popular with your beekeeping friends if you actually have queens when they need them. Um, and also, I'm big into kind of, I'm big into whole systems design and actually having your whole apiary work and having control of your own queens. And I mean, I remember how powerless it feels when you have just a few colonies and you discover that you're queenless. It's this thing, which now I kind of make fun of it because people call me up all the time all panicky and because they want queens and they want to know if I have them. And I always think of that Hall Note song, of, she's gone, boy, I gotta learn how to face it. It's just funny. When you, <laughs> next time you're queenless, think of that song. And you can think of that song and how funny it is when you actually have 25 little mating nukes full of queens and so you're really not freaking out that you lost a queen or that you accidentally you know, did something bad. <coughs> because we all accidentally crush queens sometimes. So, or whatever, or they swarm on you and then you need a queen. So, um, there's lots of reasons why. Okay, so I'm not gonna get into a whole permaculture thing and show you all of my hippie stuff, but it just is an important thing to realize that designing, designing systems for live things that have as much interaction as um, with the environment as honeybees do, you kind of need to think about the larger picture and permaculture is a great way of setting up design principles for doing that. And I'm just gonna screw by this and you guys can just have this word and read a book. But really the key in permaculture is realizing that nothing ever only has one purpose. And so as I go from artificial swarming right into queen rearing, right into IPM strategies, right into overwinter nucleus colonies, and then to whole apiary system management, it's a very permaculture-y kind of concept. And that's why it's sustainable, and that's why it really works. The other thing about things that need to be sustainable is they have to actually be achievable by you, which is different than what is achievable by me, and different than what's achievable by everybody else. And so unless you want to like quit your life and take over my life, then exactly my system isn't gonna be exactly what yours is, but I think many of my principles can be adopted to lots of people's bee yards. And so you want to be, you don't, don't bite off more than you can chew because it's just frustrating to, uh, to you know, kind of overcommit and then fail. You want to utilize your resources to the fullest extent possible. And by that I mean that Kirk Webster once said to me, you should never expand your apiary um, until you are maximizing everything you have. So if you have two hives and you're not using your beeswax and you're not selling your honey yet, it's too you don't it's not time to expand yet. You really should be, you know, getting all of your outputs, finding avenues to utilize them. And then also you want to work with the bees' natural habits as much as possible, and artificial swarming is a great example of that. <coughs> so once you can do queen rearing, you can do all of these cool things. Increasing skills is a great thing. Well, I was talking earlier, and, and by talking I meant shaming, about um, wearing no gloves in your bee yard. The queen, the nukes, the, the mating nucleus, the queen rearing section of your yard is going to be the first place where you are comfortable with no gloves because the colonies are so tiny and weak that they are barely defensive at all. And so this is where you learn that bees will walk all over your hands and not sting you all the time and you'll develop the confidence to start inspecting your nukes, your full size nukes with no gloves. And then, I mean, I specifically remember saying to my husband one day, like, I can't imagine you know, ever being gloveless and extracting honey. 
Like, I definitely had that conversation with him. Like, it's working fine with the nukes, but I'm never going to be not suited up and extracting honey. And now I literally, I mean, if I wear anything more than a veil all year, it's because I'm up against a bumblebee nest, and those guys are like total badasses. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, queen and super fun. And it makes you have that look on your face, which I do not get that look on my face very often. But hunting queens is definitely a place where you do. So um, this is the perfect time to be talking about this because you're going to need to buy some things if you don't have them already to get your queen rearing program going. And now is the time to buy stuff for spring. So we want to think and plan ahead. You cannot do queen rearing. You cannot start your queen rearing program when you find the queen cells in your hive. Like, at that point, you got to have had your stuff, and you have to have at least thought about it. you got to have some skill and dedication, meaning that you do, it's not something that you um, just totally do on a whim. Like, not just random people won't be successful. Um, you do need to understand the timing of queen rearing, and lots of books and lots of things on the internet, and calendars and Excel spreadsheets that you can figure out to do the timing. You definitely need unlimited access to food. So unlike in the South where they have a dearth all summer long and queen rearing you can't do for very long, we can do queen rearing quite well right through to the end of July, which is about the right time to do. And then you do need to be attentive and available. And by that I mean it's better if you don't have a five day a week straight job that is an hour and a half commute from your home. But I have a five day a week straight job that is an hour and a half commute from my home and I'm still able to do it. I just um, need a little more help. And, I think I probably will sneak a few mating nukes to work, but don't tell anybody. Um, so where we want to end up is a healthy, beautiful queen in a cage. Um, this is something that I teach the almost exactly opposite backwards way from most other people who teach beekeeping and queen rearing. Because lots of people, when they think about queen rearing, jump straight into grafting and they shrink jump straight into the queen cell. And I like to go backwards from that. I like to start with the cage. So we know that our, our queen came from an egg, but we also know that beekeepers don't rear queens. Bees rear queens, right? And so it doesn't really matter how we trick the bees into rearing the queens or if they do it on their own. The beekeeper part is much more involved in the timing and also the movement of the queen. So. The only factor that makes a fertilized queen is the food um, fed by, made, produced in the heads of the nurse bees. So we're not feeding queens nectar and pollen. We're eating nectar and pollen and producing royal jelly in the glands of our heads and feeding that to babies. So nutrition really is an important thing. Like the queen larval diet influences lots and lots of things. Um, yeah. I could talk about that for a long time. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody's name, but I'm forgetting it. This is, this is a big piece. OK. So don't get hung up on where the queen cell comes from. And I'll give you permission to get unhung up about that about 15 more times throughout the rest of the day. But so what is important is to rear queens when we have pollen coming into the hive, we have fresh nectar coming in the hive, because we're feeding our baby nurse bees. So, the house bees who move the food, the foraging, incoming foraging population, these are the people who feed the nurse bees. And you also can feed as well. If you feed so nectar and pollen from your strong colonies, like you don't have to feed pollen substitute and sugar water. You can just have strong colonies that are literally there donating their food to your queen rearing program. And then you're on natural nutrition, which is uh, very important for development. So, the, particularly in the backyard queen rearing program, like the less you read about commercial beekeeping or commercial queen rearing, the better. Because many of those things are designed for efficiency or for maximizing lots of different colonies, which you don't need. You've only got two and you're only rearing a few queens. So, let's use real food instead of um, high fructose corn syrup. And so you can use strong swarm cells from your overwintered nukes, and this can be this can be the, your first year. This could be your whole life. You seriously could produce all the queens you need for the rest of your life just by taking queen cells, cap queen cells out of colonies that are already preparing to swarm. And you swear to God, if you're going to run five to eight colonies, which is the correct number of colonies for anybody, I think, 
who doesn't want to get really serious about beekeeping? And the reason I say five to eight colonies is with five to eight colonies, if they're producing about 100 pounds of honey each, that's a decent enough amount of honey to buy a good extractor and to buy a decent honey label and to be able to sell it, but it does not take over your life and gruel every weekend of every summer. Um, five to eight colonies is a very sustainable kind of size for a backyard beekeeper and yet also you know, provides enough income to basically facilitate anything you want. So if you are in that scale, then you could absolutely live the rest of your life producing every queen you ever need and a few for sale just by moving swarm cells. And I absolutely give you permission to do that if that's what you want. But if you want to get trickier, or really, if you want to have more control over timing, and that's really what um, beekeeper managed queen rearing is about, is that like we don't want to wait for the swarm cells and we don't want to have to guess about when they're going to hatch then you can move into other things that are harder. But so your constraints are gonna be your time, your ability to read the colony, your ability to handle queens, your capacity to keep your eye on your mating nukes, and so I strongly suggest if you have mating nukes to have them at home in your yard, like on your upstairs porch is a great place to have them. Um, you wanna be able to feed the mating nukes, so it needs to be easy to do that. You need to have, you can only raise as many queens as you have mating nukes to put the queen cells into, because if you have 35 queen cells and six mating nukes, you're gonna end up with six queens, right? Does that make sense? And then smart, start small and have fun, because it really is fun, and starting small is good. So this is the picture that I was looking for earlier. So this is the colony that swarmed, and so I know there's queen cells in there, right? Or maybe hatched virgins, but probably queen cells also. And so this is the place that you can start with your queen room. So all you need to do is move those queen cells from that swarmed colony into the mating nukes. And if you go in that hive, how many people have inspected a colony and actually virgins were like hatching out in their hands? It happens a lot. The disturbance of inspecting the colony, I think, makes some of those queens hatch, and it also kind of messes up their ability to fight with each other. So you gotta have cages ready. Like, that is not the time to think, oh, I should run down to the bee supply store and get some queen cages. Like, the time to think that is now, and make some queen candy, like on a crappy, rainy, yucky April day, Get some queen cages, make up your queen candy, and put them together, and put them into a little pouch, and organize your bee tool bag so you know where they are. And so, the first thing, like, you should be, if your hive has swarmed, you should be ready to cage up those queens, and think about what are we gonna do with the mating nukes. So, that's a pretty good thing to start with. Um, yeah, and if you have, you know, if you have something else, um, I mean, if you don't have a cage, you can, you know, put the, put a baby queen into a matchbox, or you know, you can do some things, but it's much better if you have her, um, if you're ready with your candy. And you can directly release them into mating nukes, which I will talk about more. So there's that cute picture of that queen again. Okay, so different types of queen cages. I really prefer this plastic thing, even though I am a person who generally does not like plastic. I really love the JZBZ queen cage, because it's just, it's easy and it fits well in the hive. Um, I like the California queen cages also, um, and then Benton queen cage is my least favorite. But if you have a choice, I would suggest going with um, JZBZ or the California queen cage. And the reason that I like those two better is because they hang between the frames more easily without violating bee space. The Benton queen cage has a tendency to violate bee space. So if you follow this recipe for queen candy, you take a two pound bag of confectioner syrup, sugar, and you heat up one cup of light corn syrup in the microwave for a minute, like just like you do a cup of coffee, and then mix them in a blender. Don't put it in your husband's good Cuisinart because it will burn out the motor. Um, something that has a, like a dough hook or something is a little bit better. And so this will make enough queen candy for everybody in this room together for two years. So, um, which is a block of queen candy about the size of, you know, half the size of a two pound bag of confectioner sugar because it gets dense. But so this is a great thing that you could do um, and bring it to a bee club and put them all in those little Tupperwares, those little tiny Tupperwares like for salad dressing and share them with your friends. So you don't all need to go mix one, but this is a great way to, um, this would be a fun thing to do at a club thing. Like everybody who's gonna do queen rearing, come on in, 
and get Queen Kenny. Um, okay, so the next thing you need to do is you have to be able to get your queen off of the frame and into your, into your queen cage. So there's our queen. Now we need to think about picking her up and putting her into the queen cage. So there's a video on YouTube of me marking a queen bee, um, and this is just something that I was at an open hive and somebody took it on their phone. But you can, I put the queen in, you can, it's a good example of how to move a queen using the little grabber, which looks like a hair clip. And so if you wanna watch that YouTube video, that's a good thing. Um, here's the queen marking protocol. So it's 2018, so this year is red or pink. Um, depending on what color you like. And you can remember this a different number of different ways. The traditional way of saying um, is when you requeen get the best is to remember what yours, but I like to say what? You raise green bees? Um, okay, like I said earlier, you can buy them from different places, but the Unimposca, um pens are the ones that I like and you can get them on the internet very easily. And there's my hot pink, which you can see, that would be very obvious in the hive as opposed to say, for example, the yellow color. So it is interesting that more, you know, lots of people will say that uh, up to one third of all colonies have two queens in them at some point every year. And I don't think that that's not true. Here's a perfect example of this. Um, often people will stop looking for the queen once they've seen a queen. But when you mark your queens in your hive, then you will know that whether you have two queens, because you'll be like, hey, my note says that the queen is marked green, and here I see an unmarked queen. And so then you go ahead and mark that queen, and then you move a few frames over, and then you find her sister, or her mother, actually, I guess. Um, there's the red marked queen right there. So I really, a few people feel like marking is like, wrong or dangerous or injuring their queen, and it's, I've never seen any indication of anything, nor have I read it or heard of anybody who's actually had damages to the queens. Um, and I do like to make two color marks um, to indicate, like I'll do like a pink one with a little yellow dot next to it or something, for, so to keep your eye on queens who are very special to you. Um, it's a great way to do it. Um, yeah. I will say one other thing about marking Kind of going back to the concept of manipulating or you know whatever, controlling bees and controlling queens. Some people advocate for clipping queens, which is that you cut a portion of their wing. And what that does is it basically limits their ability to fly. So it has some kind of capacity in swarm control, but that can also backfire deeply. Like if, the, if they try to swarm and the queen just falls to the ground and then it rains, that can be a big issue. But really the thing that queen clipping does, the one bit of value that it has, is paint can be chewed off or worn off and clipped wings can never be regrown. And so you know for sure if you clip all your queens that it is the same queen as the one you had before. And there are some people that I like that do this. And by some people that I like, I mean Paul Carroll Kelly in Ontario, who is part of uh, University of Guelph and has wonderful videos on beekeeping, is part of the Buckfest Queen Rearing Program. And so it's very important to them that their Buckfest Queens be the ones they raised, and so they clip queens. But anybody else who clips queens isn't. <laughs> and so I do not recommend doing it unless you have a really good reason, like the really good reason that Paul Kelly has. And so while I will mark queens all day long, I will never advocate for clipping queens unless you have a really good reason. Okay, so how do you get queens into the cage? This is, I know that it sounds like, huh, that should be really easy, but lots of people will get all the way to this point and then they freak out because they're like, I have to pick up a queen and then like, what am I gonna do? And I don't wanna squish her. And so instead, instead of actually getting over the squish fear, they actually just never do the queen rearing, which, so they give up control of their apiary over the fear of sticking a queen in the thing. First of all, although they can, queens don't sting. Like, I cannot tell you how many hundreds and hundreds of queens I have held in my hand just like this, running around, freaking out in my hand, and never have I been stung by a queen. And so the queen is relatively easy to just pick up and put into the cage. So you, 
um, you block one hole, you detach one side of the wire, and then you put her in, and then you put the cage, then you put the screen back down. That simple, just like in the Benton Queen cage. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you on the JCBZ in a minute. So we put this staple the screen back on, then you remove the cork, and then you pick up nurse bees off of the frame. Okay, who here has seen Queen of the Sun? Queen of the Sun movie? You remember the dude who's like, oh, they look. Okay. Nurse bees are too young to sting. Okay, do you hear me say that? Nurse bees are too young to sting. Those bees had nothing to do with like that man. That man was brushing the bees with his mustache because they were nurse bees. So if you pick up nurse bees and put them into the cage with your queen, if you get little baby nurse bees, they will be too young to sting you too. How do you know that nurse bees are nurse bees? You are on the open frame of brood and you look for the bees who are feeding eggs and larvae. Those are the nurse bees. So simple and yet so complex. And so also if you pick them up by the back of their wings, so you pick them up off the frame, and you stick your finger, if you stick your little, so I just picked up off the frame with these two fingers, if you stick your little pinky finger behind underneath here so that she cannot twist around and sting you, even if you don't get a nurse bee, you still have your bee. And you put her head into the queen cage and she will run away from you because why? Bees don't like being picked up. <laughs> and they don't really want to sting you either. They really want you to leave them alone. So it's very easy, to be much easier than you would think, to pick nurse bees up and see, can you see how she's all like twisting around? You know what I mean? And so you just stick your finger right there and it's fine. And then you stick her head in there, she goes running in. You place the bees head first into the cage, cover the hole in the cage until you have five or seven. And they're not gonna, when you stick your finger over here, they're not gonna all come back up against you and try to stick to sting you. They just, I swear to God, they won't. I've never been stung by people coming out trying to sting me because they're, they're too busy freaking out. Yes, you have a question. Uh, you really don't want to handle the queen. Is, uh, what you do is buy an extra marking plunger, remove the mesh, and put something, you can use uh, like a baby pacifier, uh, and cut the end off it. So basically you have like a little funnel. Uh, and you fit that over the, uh, over the marking plunger, and I just, uh, you just got, you know, you do the same thing you do when you mark it. Yeah. Yeah. So he's saying that you can modify apparatus to do that. They also now have this very funky. The, the, I think the Dan carries it now. This, they have this very funky German mating and marking doodad with a little moving doodad. Yeah. I mean, so you know, there's. A, which, if you start with, if you start with your doodad, one of the days, someday, we're going to have your queen, and you're going to be just ready to pick her up and move her, and then you're going to step on your doodad and crush it like a bug, and on that day, you're going to say, you know what? I'm just going to go for it, and from then on, you're not going to need your doodad, and that's how everything happens in life, right? It's just like the time that you learn how to do anything without the other tool, you just said, screw it. So it's, but yes, you can, you can buy the thing. Yes, you can practice on drones, both picking up and moving, but they act different, and they vibrate different. And so it's, it gets you a little bit over the fear, but the reality is that practicing in real life is still different. So drones will, it's like a baby step, but drones in particular really do act differently in the hive. And knowing that, um, like being confident to just pick up nurse bees and knowing the baby nurse bees aren't gonna sting you is much better than picking up drones because they do behave like babies. So, okay, now that we caged our queen, and we set her aside, where did we get that queen? So, hopefully she came from our mating nukes, right? Because that's where the mated queen came from. And so you gotta have mating nukes to do your queenery. And the thing is, the whole point of mating nukes is a mating nucleus colony is any colony specifically set up just for the mating part of queen urine. And so typically they are small, 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 because we want to dedicate the least amount of resources to getting one queen mated. Because there is a decent probability that any individual virgin will not make it back because of birds and other wildlife and things, you know, dragonflies. I mean, there are predators to bees, and some of them get eaten. 
So do you don't want to use a colony of 60,000 bees to make one queen at, with that low success. So instead, we want to have, we want to use small colonies. And each style of mating nuke has advantages and disadvantages. And I showed you on my other slide, I quickly ran through, uh, my, here's my war a hive, and here's my AZ hive, and here's my ding dong other thing, and the stupid top bar hive that I hate, um, my observation hive. Trust me when I say that I am as gadgety as it gets. And if you can buy something in the United States or Europe that has looked even remotely interesting to me, I have bought it and have tried it. And the reason that I do that is, once again, because I'm an accountant, and I also produce a fairly substantial amount of honey, and which I sell because I don't believe in selling honey for not very good money, because the bees worked hard and they would kill me if I sold it for shit. But I also don't want to pay taxes. And so instead, I like to spend all of my beekeeping money doing things like building 20 by 12 by 20 foot timber frame barns and you know traveling to Europe and all you know do beekeeping conferences and all that kind of stuff and so I spend a lot of money on mating nukes so I'm going to tell you about the ones that I like the best okay this is a very typical small little tiny styrofoam mating nuke this one comes from Mad Lake and this is the Brushy Mountain Divided Hive Box and so these are basically the two families of mating nukes that I recommend that you start with. And there are definitely lots of other options that are good, but these are the ones that I kind of do, but not exactly these ones. This, so this, this is the little styrofoam mating nuke that Man Lake sells that is okay. And I actually have one out of my car, I should have brought it in. But it is, uh, 50% of the size of this actual photograph. So the mating nuke itself is this big, right? Little. And so the issue with this mating nuke is that once the queen gets back and starts laying, she will almost immediately plug it out and then they get overcrowded and then we're talking about overcrowded swarming, which I had mentioned the other day. And so this mating nuke is designed for an operation that is gonna flip the queens out very quickly which probably your backyard beekeeper isn't going to because you don't actually know what you're doing with this queen. You're just rearing them for fun at this point. You don't have a destination for her and you also probably don't have a queen cell coming right behind it. And so because of that, I love this mating nuke, which is also styrofoam, which comes from Germany and which has these little honey supers. And so if they start plugging out the, hot, the little mating nuke, you can put the honey super on and it makes more space and then they grow up and then they grow up. And now if you imagine this, I should have taken a picture of this and put it in the slide presentation, but I keep, I always say that when I'm giving it and then I forget about it. Is this the Russian No, this one is from Germany. Um, imagine if I have, which I do, 10 of these all in a row, like, this time said, this is actually at EIS. I took my mating nuke to EIS to give a talk. Um, but so if you had 10 of these little mating nukes, when I'm done taking the queen out, I just take the frame, so I take the queen out of the one next door. So now that one is queenless. I let them be queenless for 24 hours. They lose all their playing cards. And then I use some empty supers and I just stack them on top here. And so by the end of the fall, when I'm done with my queen rearing program, I am actually overwintering big starter from mating nucleus colonies. And I think I do have a picture of that in here somewhere. Um, and that way, I don't ever have to totally depopulate the colony. So this is that same thing um, disassembled in my kitchen table and bottles of wine. Um, this is a little feeder. It's an internal feeder. And you can see it actually lifts out. So you can take the little feeder out and put two more bars in. So it's like a little top bar um, mating nuke, but it's not horizontal, it's vertical, but it is just top bars, it doesn't have frames. Anyway, and they're super great. It is called a Keeler mating nuke, K-E-I-L-L-O-R. And as far as I know, there isn't anybody in the United States who is importing these. I buy mine from modernbeekeeping.co.uk. There is a modernbeekeepingusa.com website, which is associated with Modern Beekeeping in England, and they have this on their website, but it always says sold out. And so I had to buy them from Europe. But they're the only mating nukes that I know of that actually have this modular, um, the styrofoam, the second supers, which is the critical piece to why I really like these. Um, okay, the other mating nukes that I really like are these divided hive body styles. 
but I like the ones that are divided into three sections. And the reason I like the ones that are divided into three sections is they take three frames each section. So I can move a frame of brood with the queen cell. I can move another frame with some brood on it. So I can basically get two frames with brood, and then I can get a third bowed frame in there. The ones that are divided into four sections only have two frames space. And so if I put two frames of brood, then the food has to be on that frame. It also is harder to keep it warm. There's not a big enough cluster for main um, to have just two frames. It's hard to keep warm. So that's why I like these three bangers. And that's my Airstream, yes. This is my mating yard. Thank you, yes, super cute. That's my like, I imagine that I will like do beekeeping stuff in there and take naps, but really I just keep my notes in there. Um, someday I'll take naps. Someday when I'm retired, I'll take lots of naps. But so Brushy Mountain makes this three banger one and Kelly also, Kelly Beekeeping makes this three banger one. And so those are the um, divided hive body styles that I like. Okay, here they are again. This is just more pictures of my yard. These are, you know, in operation. These are several years old. That's probably 10 years old. Um, there again is the little Man Lake one that I said is a little bit too small. This is an EAS. They're not actually in prison. That's in the EAS yard. But they do plug right up. And you can see I had to have my mating loops inspected by the Maine State Beekeepers Association to transport them to Vermont for EAS, which was fun. <laughs> okay, so pros and cons. The little teeny tiny ones from Man Lake are less than 20 bucks, and that's good. They require few, fewer bees. That's good. They're easy to carry and put in the basement, and I'll talk about why we're gonna go in the basement, but just, you know, you can think about it, and you'll remember. Um, easy to travel with, you just strap the lid on with a good elastic, and interior space is easy for bees to keep warm in the early season. The drag about them is they're made of styrofoam, and like I said, I'm not much of a fan of styrofoam and plastic. Bees plug out the small space quickly, particularly on the man like one that you buy here, and not the European one. The brood, doesn't go with the queen, and the last round of brood dies in the fall. And that is really the drag. So go back to this. Um, we're just gonna imagine, okay, right? Because they have three little frames of brood in there, right? So let's say it's August, and I'm gonna take this queen, I have a, a hive that's failing. Let's say uh, my queen has gone drone layer. And so I'm going to take the last queen out of my little doodad mating nuke, right? And I put her in. But this mating nuke is an operating unit. And so they have brood and bees and a forage field course and everything. And I just took their queen away. And it's August. It's too late for them to requeen themselves. This is too small for them to survive in through winter. So, like, what do I do? You know, like, I can shake the bees out. I can shake the live bees out into the other colony and you know maybe they'll drift back to the space or not, but I've got this brood in there, which I can just let die. I mean, I can let them go all the way queenless and you know, go laying worker and you know, whatever. Or I could you know, put on my big girl beekeeper panties and accept the fact that I'm killing these bees and actually just kill them myself on purpose. I could put soapy water in there or something. I could stick the whole thing in the freezer. You can try like flipping the frames up to down underneath the nuke box, you know what I mean? Or put them over something or under an inner cover or whatever, and, which doesn't really work and it's not very elegant, it's kind of a drag. But so that's the thing about this, is there's the end of the season is kind of a bummer. Particularly when you fall in love with this little super organism that's been rearing your queens all summer. You know, you got three queens out of this little team and you're so proud of it and the fall kind of sucks. And so, which is why, why I'm explaining that, because most people, when you're buying the mating nukes and you're reading in the catalog what the thing is, they don't say, fall sucks with this one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it's true. And so when along comes your first fall, and you're like, nobody ever mentioned this part. Okay, I mentioned it. Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna stick with why that was a little bit of a drag. And now I'm gonna talk about how to get the bees into the mating nuke, and then I'm gonna talk about the other one. So. How you get the bees in the mini nuke is, first of all, you gotta find your hive that you're gonna get the bees from and get your queen away. Like, you don't wanna be accidentally shaking your queen into the mating nuke. So, this could be the colony that swarmed and is super overpopulated because you know there's no queen in there because they swarmed. 
or it could be the one that you just artificial swarmed on purpose, right? That could be where you're going. Or it could be that you just pull your queen and you set her aside and she's in the marking tube, she's in the special German doodad, and is carefully set outside, of, you know, not in the sun, and not somewhere you're gonna step on her. And so you get your queen out of the donor hive, and then you literally just go into the brood nest. So the frames with open brood with eggs and larvae on them, and you just take a frame of these, and you shake them into a dish pan. <coughs> um, just like a cheap, cheese doggy little plastic dish pan, like what you might use um, to wash dishes in college. And then you can spray them lightly with sugar water with a sprayer, but often if you're doing this in the spring, you're gonna find that there's nectar in those brood frames anyway, and so the bees will get wet from the shaking of the nectar <coughs> on the bees. And so then you scoop the bees with a nice rounded edge measuring cup, and by rounded edge measuring cup, I mean don't go buy one of those nice sharp ones like from dance, good. Like, you have to feel really good when you're swiping the flower off it because you don't want to injure the bees when you scoop them. Just a little plastic um, measuring cup, cup is perfect. Insert the frames into the, so you put the bees, scoop the bees into the mating nook, then you insert the frames on top, fill the feeder, put the queen cell in, put the lid on, close the entrance, and stick them in the basement. And so you continue like this until you've populated all of the mating nooks, so they're all closed up, and you put the rest of the nurse bees that you have in your dish pan back into the colony, and then you put your mating nukes in a cool, dark place for like three days, and what we're doing here is preventing them from drifting, because they don't necessarily, it's gonna take them three days to recognize that your queen cell and they are a cohesive unit, so they don't drift right back to their colony. And then on the third evening, just before deaths, you take the mating nukes out of the basement and set them in their permanent location. We all caught that, right? Super easy. Yes. Yes, it's, in this case it's queen cells. But it could have been hatched queens. If you had just been catching queens, you could put them in here. Probably you would want to cage them so they don't fly. What if it was uh, not quite capped? Is that okay? we, we need to wait until our queen cells are capped. Because the mating nuke, we need them to be all the way fed before you move them. The mating nuke is too small a colony to do the, finish the feeding. Yes. Yes. So one cup of bees Depending on the size, like one cup of bees is plenty in that little maid, in that man lake one. In my German one, it's probably more like three cups. Yes. Um, so you have the queen cell that you've gotten from the one that was going to swarm. Can mm -hmm. you kind of like toss it in? Um, I'll pin it to the top. I'll see if I can show it to you. Okay. Paul Kelly, not actually my boyfriend, but I have a huge crush on him. <laughs> He's the one who clips queens, and he has all of these beautiful videos on the YouTube. Uh, University of Guelph has a whole series of videos, all these different things, making all these things, including populating mini nukes. And so him and all of his adorable French-speaking Canadian grad student girls are up there shaking mini nukes with no veil on. It's, and so you can watch those videos all night long. What's his name again? Paul Kelly. Paul Kelly, University of Guelph. Um, adorable assistants. Um, this is where Dennis Van Engelstorp came from. It's from University of Guelph. Also Ernesto Guzman. Okay. Oh, I thought I had a. I thought I had this picture of slides of me doing the mating things. Anyway, um, literally, you can watch this 17-minute video of them populating mating nooks a hundred times between now and spring. And so, but you literally do just scoop the bees, a couple of scoops of bees, into the mating nooks, put the frames in. Fill the feeder, put the lid on, close the entrance, put them in the basement for three days. And so with the queen cell, if you cut it out of a frame, you want to cut enough above it that you're really not handling the queen cell itself, and you can just hang it between the, um, between the bars. That's what these holes are for. And if you take a toothpick and kind of pin across the top of that extra bit of wax that you had above it, which is also going to probably have brood, half brood, not queen brood, but half, and just hang it right down there through the center. You want it in the center of the mating nuke. And that's, you also can depress, you can also depress a um, space on the face of the comb itself and just kind of pin it in there by the wax, touching each other. Yes. So is that foundation or umbrella So these guys start with, um, these guys will actually start with a starter strip of foundation or nothing. 
and my little top bar, the German ones only start with top bars. But you can populate these with no comb in them at all. That's what Paul Kelly does every year. But then you do need to hang, you need to hang your queen cell with the, um, with the toothpick. And the bees, that's why you have the internal feeder. The bees will draw that comb out beautifully. Um, I literally do have one in the car. Will you go to my car and get it? It's the Volvo with the bee stuff on the main plates against the back wall. And there's a bunch of mating stuff in the back, including closest to the back seat is this little tiny styrofoam doodad. Thank you, sorry. See, I just shanghai him. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the divided hives. So, divided hive pros. You can use the frames directly from your colony straight into the divided hive. There's no shaking of bees, there's no picking up of the queen, there's no cutting the queen cell. You take the frame with the queen cell and put it right in the divided hive. That's a really nice thing. Um, you can feed with frames of food. Like you literally can just take frames of food from other colonies and feed with that. Whereas the other one you couldn't feed with food. Um, you don't have to move the queen cells. When you want to depopulate the divided hive, the frames just go into another hive. So none of this, I have to kill the bees in the fall, none of that, ding dong. So it's easy to break them down. The downside is, early in the season, it requires a lot more than two cups of bees because you've got to have enough bees to keep the whole frame of brood warm. So we're taking a larger population to the divided hive. But, but again, remembering, you're also going to put them back later. So it's not like they're you know, out of commission or something. Oops. The three frame one, when completely populated three frames across with the bottom board, inner cover, and outer cover on it, probably weighs, I don't know, 35, 38, 40 pounds. Like, it probably requires a wheelbarrow to walk from the bee yard to the basement, as opposed to the little mating nukes, which you could just basically carry. Which is not a huge con, but it's just I'm saying that's one of the downsides, is it can be a little bit difficult to, have, to carry. They're difficult to feed with liquid feed unless you modify the lids, and I'll show you my modified lid. Did I miss you saying, here's my keys? Oh, shit. <laughs> See, I never lock my car because I never lock my car because I live in Maine. And, um, and it's, but now I'm down here in Massachusetts, and so I'm acting against my own habits. Of course, I didn't even think about the fact that the locks are. There's all these bad Massachusetts people are trying to break into people's beehives, steal my nukes. All those Massachusetts lawyers want to steal my nucleus colony. Okay. Um, so they require more bees, and they can be can tricky to keep the compartment separated. And by that I mean they're separated often by like a little piece of gluon, and then everything warps. And so you have to keep a little piece of, I use um, plastic grain bag um, just right over the top, which I'll see if I can show this to you. Okay, so this is a slide from my beginner bee school. We've all been taught that you should have a comb rotation program, right? Like everybody knows you're supposed to be taking a certain number of frames out of your beehive every year so that you're cycling in new ones and having young, new, fresh comb. Well, this is a great part of your comb rotation program is because you wanted to get a couple of frames out of your regular brood box and put in some foundation. So now we're cycling those things out and putting them into our mating nukes. And so when you're doing comb rotation program, you always want to take out the junky crap first because we don't want to have that in the hive anymore, stuff that was all mouse-eaten or is too droney or what is too old, it's 700 years old. Um, the second choice is you want to take extra stores, which are perfect for saving for your nukes, to stick them in the freezer if you need to, to store them. And then your third choice is just good frames of drawn comb, and so you take those out and use them for um, your mating nukes. So, this is kind of part of that sustainable apiary program where before we're like, well, now that I took these frames out, what am I going to do with them? Well, you put them in your mating nukes. Okay. So, now that we're making decisions and buying things, how many nukes cases do you want to get? Like, do you want to buy three of those three banger mating nukes? And so now you have nine potential spaces for queens. Maybe. Maybe you want one. Maybe you want two. Maybe you want one of the three bangers 
and a couple of styrofoam doodads? Like, what are you going to do with your queen once you got them? Are you going to make an increase and accidentally go from two hives to seven to 12 to 24 to 47 to 70 and then get divorced and then end up with 150 and then take them to work? And now your business partner leaves and you have 150 hives and you're like, I think I have bees for sale this spring, maybe. Maybe not. Um, you know, just think about it. Like, that's a thing to think about. And, you know, what's, what is the best advantage in your current apiary system? Because everybody's going to be in a different situation. Okay. So assuming that you've just decided what your mating nukes are going to be, you're going to get two of those three bangers and a couple of styrofoam doodads. Now, how are we going to get the swarm cells? And this is when I go back to saying that literally... You can just use swarm cells for your own hive. You don't actually have to run your queen or You can just shut down your ears to everything that I say. Ta da! See, here's my adorable little mating name. Um, yes. <laughs> it's so cute, isn't it? So, that, um, that's, this is what it looks like on the inside. So, it's like half feeder. And of course, they draw foam down in there sometimes, and the queens get in there, and you can't find them and stuff. But I mean, it is pretty easy to find a queen on when you only have this many frames. Like, she can't be that far, right? <laughs> so anyway, this, so I just pulled this out of the, uh, I was teaching b-school, so I left it in the park. But yeah, so little mating nuke. This is the one that's a little bit too small. This is not the good German one. This is the one that's a little bit too small. Um, but it's, it's absolutely fine. I mean, it's just, it would be really nice if somebody in the United States would start selling the good one. Okay, so. You can just cut out swarm cells out of your own hives. You can learn to graft. I know people whose very first thing about queen rearing they ever did was go take an artificial insemination class, which to me is like insanity. Um, or you can use a non-grafting method of queen rearing, which is what I would suggest for beginner backyard beekeepers. And so you can absolutely, I also recommend you can absolutely just start with letting the bees rear the queens and you just react to their schedule. Because the only downside to this is that you don't know that your queens are gonna be ready on June 10th. Like if I want queens ready on June 10th, I can back a schedule up and I can do certain things in May that mean I have a queen on June 10th. But if I'm you, which I could be, I can just have all my stuff ready and then when I see queen cells, then I say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to set up the mating nukes, right? I mean, no big deal. As long as you have them ready and you're looking, that's fine. So I'm just giving you permission to not listen to anything else I say.